with the concept of collaboration happens, um, one thing that I really want to point out is that it happens and the most important thing is to know when it's working for you and when it's not working for you, okay? So for, uh, I'll give you, the, the example I can give you is that when I, I've never been in a comdis department. Let me start that way. Um, and so for me, collaboration was always happening. My, I started out at the NIH in the laryngeal and speech section where there was voice, speech, language, swallowing happening, but it was happening among biomedical engineers, ENT, speech pathologists, psychologists, biologists, all of us under Christy Ludlow's um, um, uh, mentorship, which was cool. We're all looking at the same topic in different ways. So in my view, collaboration happens in a number of ways. You have people who are of a similar background, who are looking at a multitude of things, and as a result, they end up having to reach out because they realize, gosh, we don't have expertise in XYZ. That sometimes happens when you're dealing with new technology. Like, you're like oh my gosh, I really want to know how the brain controls X fMRI. Wow, I really need to talk to folks who are, understand imaging. So it can happen that way out of pure necessity. But it can happen because the topic is inherently collaborative similarly to swallowing, for instance. So there are a couple of ways to collaborate, and again, the most important thing is to figure out how it works best for you. Um, another uh, point that I wanted to make is that having a different approach to research is something that we find exists even if it's, we're all in the same topic. So let's say everybody's really interested in stuttering, for, for instance. If you are dealing with maybe making a device and you need to deal with biomedical engineers, I know engineers sometimes get the brunt of the jokes, but they are different thinkers than some people are in perhaps behavioral human-related science. And my view is that you might not be learning a whole lot about um, an engineer's view of stuttering, but you might understand about an engineer's way of approaching research that could be useful for you, right? And sometimes my experience has been where Basic scientists might approach things differently from folks who deal with humans, and we can actually take something from both sides. Um, another point that was that I wanted to make in this slide is that we think of science a team sport, but when I think of team sport, sometimes I think of sports where everybody's agreeing and sports when everyone's not agreeing, right? So we assume, I think the first thing I read when I saw that, it was like, we're all in the same team, team sport. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you do butt, head with, butt heads with people you collaborate with. The, mo the important thing is to sort of get a sense of when it's not a team sport, we're all on the same team. Think synchronized swimming as opposed to hockey, perhaps ice hockey. I'm Canadian, so that's the first thing I think of with all the, all the fighting and the bloody noses. Um, but the point is that you can have situations where you don't have a team goal in mind. And um, sometimes political strat strategizing with a mentor can really help you to, to sort of navigate that without um, burning bridges. Um, so collaboration needs to be strategic. One thing that I've learned since I've not been in a comdis department is that strategy is everything when people have a view of your topic or your field before you get there, okay? When you, I find that, so many of you, some of you may or may not know that I'll be um, moving to the University of Florida and Susan will be my new department chair. Um, and that's toward the end of the summer. And it was just bizarre to me that how, even though, you know, my degrees are all speech pathology, I had no clue. The questions I was asking about how to be a faculty in a communication scientist to, sciences department is completely different from a school of medicine, which is where I've been at Hopkins. At Hopkins, you eat what you kill. So my collaborations were really very strategic in terms of who's getting me my patients, who's this. And it was completely okay to think that way. It was completely okay to, to look, for, look out for yourself because if you don't fund your salary 100%, well, you're not here anyway to collaborate with anybody. <laughs> but now moving into a comdis department, it's a different kind of approach in terms of collaboration. Service is on the list now. Look at that. So I now need to understand how to, to deal with people who have different things in mind besides how do I get my next grant and where, where's my next publication coming from, and um, much more student-oriented. So that's where strategy sort of has had to come in for me because it really had a whole lot to do with what my environment is and sort of what my environment's goal was really based on. Um, but leveraging diversity of knowledge, in my view, 
extends beyond just the other scientists in the room. Um, as long as I've been around, I've learned who the gatekeepers are at the institution. They may or may not even be your department chair. They may or may not even be the dean. Um, sometimes you think, if I can get the person on top to help me with X, when really it's perhaps the administrative assistant that really is a, supposed to be a really good partner for you. And you find you're collaborating with not just other scientists, you're collaborating with students, you're collaborating with, with administrative assistants, you're collaborating with many of the clinicians who will be helping you with data collection, and that their needs and their um, incentives are as important as yours are, okay? And so um, I think, unfortunately, uh, many of the professional development talks that I've been to have been talking about collaborating with other scientists, especially that person who's, you know, really important, whose name should be on your grant. But you can get all that, and then you can't get anything done because you forgot about the people who make the whole ship move, and namely your ship. And so that's really something that we often forget about and has been really helpful for me as well. I think unequal intellectual ownership and workload distribution, we can all relate to, okay? Sometimes they're misunderstandings, but sometimes I think believing what is coming, what believing uh, what people are showing you is a, is a skill, okay? So here's what I mean by that. Unequal intellectual ownership and workload distri distribution. With workload distribution, it's pretty obvious to most of us if you feel like you're pulling most of the weight, right? Sometimes people perhaps lend a name to your, to your project, and we know they're lending their name and, and mentorship and expertise as needed. That's perhaps maybe the person who's 5% on your grant, right? For whom that 5% takes half your budget, if you know what I mean, right? So those are the people who have a lot of gravitas. They're senior people and, and they can really guide, generally guide your ship. But then there are the people who are sort of doing a lot of the daily work. And that is often where junior or mid-level faculty tend to be, okay? And sometimes if you're collaborating with somebody at that level, there needs to be more, um, let's say, objective listing, perhaps, of what the work is supposed to be. And sometimes unequal workload distribution can make a collaboration really go down because you might be feeling you're doing all the work, or even worse, you feel like you're doing all the work, and then when it comes time for authorship, nobody else did and you're not where you think you should be, okay? So I have found that having very um, scripted um, lists of things that need to be done and who should be doing it helps that. That way when you find that, oh, wow, um, this is really backed up, do you recall that we agreed that you'd be doing X as opposed to assuming that that would be happening? I think that can really save a lot of relationships. Um, unequal intellectual, intellectual ownership. So there's, there's two ways to look at that. One perhaps is um, if you're working with someone for whom you thought had a lot of information and as it turns out, they, they perhaps did not have as much. That's kind of a sticky situation to be in as opposed to someone who ends up bringing in a whole lot more to the project. That's always welcome. It's always welcome to be completely surprised positively. This person really is a wealth of information. And learning to manage that, I think, comes by doing your research in advance. When I'm going to collaborate with somebody, I try my best to read more about the kinds of things that they've done. I try my best to go to their talks. I try my best to talk to people who they've collaborated with. I think those are things that you can do that will set you up for the comments where, yeah, this person's really, oh, this person's just a genius in this, but kind of moody, or just whatever, whatever subjective information you get. So you can make a decision, moody, I can do moody. I think that's okay, I've had, you know, I can do that. Or, you know, that's just not for me. Because sometimes personality and actually your, what you actually know about a topic, sometimes they, sometimes they collide. And the last point is use common sense, are you stuck? So one thing that I wanted to say about the common sense and are you stuck is something that I think Ed mentioned, which is reading. Read, read, read. I think we have a tendency to read in our field way more than we read in other people's field and related fields. I think that, that can really help when moments when you're stuck. So. My currently, I went from, I'm in um, PMNR, physical medicine rehab. So I went from having colleagues that were more bioengineer, 
neuroanatomist at UW to OT, PT, SLP, neuropsych, and physiatrist, or at Hopkins, physiatrist, because they have to be special, right? So physiatrist. Um, so um, I would say that I had to then transform my thinking from more of a basic science model, which I was working with some of the neuroanatomists who are doing mouse model morphology type things, to a pretty strong re re rehab, right? So really, and that worked well for me as it turned out because there's, swallowing is pretty inherently rehab. We're not doing a whole lot to prevent it unless we're preventing stroke and cancer in general. So I had to go then and read a whole lot of background stuff so I can have a conversation with potential collaborators who are focused on limb and limbs and, and uh, ocular motor with the neuros, neuro folks and vestibular. And I hadn't even been thinking about rehab in those domains. So I think when it comes to common sense, it seems like it's common sense for us to read because we do a lot of reading to be in, re in, in research in the first place. But then when we get stuck, often it's going back to PubMed or wherever you get your, your science to really say, I think I just need to take a step back and just see what other people are doing. What are other models that are, that are being used? So the, the last point I wanted to make is it's not in the information that was up there, but collaboration is huge for funding. When we think of the NIH, we often think of, well, where's my funding coming from? You know, it's not just, we've already heard, you know, diversify your profile. There's VA. There are all these other opportunities. But even within the NIH, um, even though my grants have been funded by DCD, sometimes they've been reviewed and pr have program officers in completely different areas, NIA. NCMRR, which is um, rehab, and then NIDCD would maybe go back and take it and fund it. And I would have never thought that my grants would be reviewed in such different groups. And learning how to talk to people who don't know your area is so important for getting collaborators interested in what you're doing, because you need them sometimes, and they might not think they need you, and trying to appeal to them. But it matters so much when you're writing a paper and when you're writing a grant, when you're writing a paper for a general journal, my conversations with people in a completely different field has made me frame my significance differently from an ASHA journal, for instance, than from, I don't know, um, a journal of applied physiology. So I have to talk about why this matters to the whole system, and it's not a niche area. Whereas when I go to dysphagia, I don't have to go on, on and on about fluoro because they know what that is. So. It has really helped me to learn how to target my audience, and the same thing with reviewing grants. We always hear that it's not people in your area reviewing grants, and it take, it's, it's a grantsmanship, grantsmanship skill to be able to write that way, but be able to talk um, in, in that way first helps you to figure out how you're going to get it on paper. So that's slightly off topic for collaboration, but I think um, relevant to things that we care about. <laughs>